Dr. Chol Kim here. I'm with Dr. Larry Lowe, neurosurgeon from New York. He does a lot of complex cases, so I have an opportunity to ask him about all the scary things that we see in our clinical practices. And one that's really common is called cervical myelopathy. So Dr. Lowe, you probably see a lot of patients with cervical myelopathy, right? Correct. Can you tell us if a patient has cervical myelopathy, what are the things that they should be worried about? Got it. So when we see a patient with cervical myelopathy, they tend to have pretty substantial neurological symptoms, such as difficulty using their hands, they're dropping things, they might even be having a hard time walking, they might notice significant numbness in their arms or legs. So these, I would say, within the degenerative spine population, this is a patient population that tends to present with more obvious neurological symptoms that are concerning. Yep, and this is kind of different than like a lot of the patients that we typically see in our clinical practices. Correct. And th because those patients mostly have pain. Correct. Patients with cervical myelopathy have a spinal cord problem, right? So they may have pain, but they may also have numbness, weakness, and coordination problems, right? Correct. So the typical patient that we see has a lot of pain, but they might not necessarily have true overt weakness. They might be having a difficult time walking from pain, but your cervical myelopathy patient truly has weakness, muscle atrophy. They might even surprisingly have issues with their urination and their bowel movements. So if a patient was worried about something like that, what would they do to go about getting this evaluated? What would be the first steps? I would say the first step is to seek out their primary care doctor to report these symptoms to them. And I would say typically, if the symptoms are suspicious in terms of both arm and leg weakness, I would say, getting an MRI of the cervical spine or MRI of the neck would be a good first step. So patients that have some pain, some weird numbness, yes. and maybe they start to notice they have trouble with putting on like their necklaces, buttoning their shirts, um, tripping a little bit more, dropping things more, those are signs that should be reported to the primary care doctor. Absolutely. And that primary care doctor will probably get an MRI. Yep, definitely. So let's talk about the MRI because what's funny in spine surgery is that we see a lot of abnormal MRIs Correct. in patients that have no symptoms. Right. So um, how do you go about evaluating that? And what are some of the things that uh, you should watch out for? So what I tell most patients is that I think with this sort of information immediately being available to the patient is to really try not to read the MRI line by line and let sort of the clinician make the determination. Um, typically for cervical myelopathy, what we're looking for is spinal cord compression. So is there a disc herniation? Is there a bone spur? Is there thickened ligaments that result in the spinal cord being compressed? Now, the funny thing about the body is that you can have spinal cord compression without symptoms. Right. So I think that's where it's important to be evaluated by a spine surgeon to see, is the patient that's coming in with this MRI that shows cervical spinal cord compression truly having symptoms from cervical myelopathy that yeah. wants treatment. Yeah, I think it's really important to point out that when we make a diagnosis as a spine surgeon, it's like putting together the pieces of a puzzle. And yeah. just one piece is the MRI, right. but by itself, it's not enough. You have to put together the physical exam, the history, like what the patient is experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis, right. et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, what about treatment? What is a typical treatment program look like if, if I was a patient with relatively early cervical myelopathy, but clearly symptoms that is, that's affecting my work and my quality of life? I would say as with all surgical procedures, I think we should try to do a course of non-operative management first. So oftentimes, if their symptoms are very mild, so let's just say that they're starting to notice a little bit of finger tingling, um, but they haven't dropped anything yet, um, I would say a good first step is to try good old-fashioned physical therapy to see if we can strengthen the neck muscles to help sort of prevent the further development of degeneration that would lead to further core compression. Um, if they're having a little bit of numbness in their hands, try some occupational therapy to see if we can get some of the strength back. So I would say that's a good first course. But I do think what makes cervical myelopathy unique is that it's probably one of the few things that we see as a spine surgeon where we might actually be inclined to offer surgery on that very first visit, depending on how the patient's doing. I'm really glad you brought that up because I think it's really important to point out that 
Most things that we take care of as spine patients, we take care of as non-surgeons. Right. Most of the patients that we treat, we treat them not operatively. Correct. So the body has an incredible capacity to get better, and things like herniated discs, especially down in the lumbar spine, right. the body can kind of manage that. Right. But spinal cord compression right. and, def and deformation, right. um, that's not something that the body can easily manage on its own. So we right. tend to be a little bit more aggressive about surgery in spinal cord compression. Absolutely. Right? What about the actual surgery itself? What type, what's your favorite surgery for cervical myelopathy? I would say we typically evaluate it by a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I think ultimately, as long as the surgical goals of taking the pressure off the spinal cord is achieved, then um, we accomplish our goals. I would say that in terms of patient recovery and ease of recovery, I tend to sort of favor anterior operations coming in from the front. I would say most people recover a lot quicker from that rather than sort of a posterior-based operation. And if we are coming from the back of the neck, um, if they're a good candidate, for it, I do try to avoid a fusion by doing a laminoplasty. But Got I would it. say it's a, it, that's sort of a multifaceted conversation on a case-by-case -case basis on sort of what is the best way to achieve the goal while causing minimal morbidity. Yeah, I think one of the issues with spine is that there's six discs essentially in the neck. Right. It would be like having six knee joints in one leg. Right. The treatment is a lot more complicated. So right. how you do the surgery depends on how many levels are involved. Absolutely. And, and how much correction you have to do. Right. And we can either do that from the front or the back. Right. Or sometimes we have to go front, back. And back. Um, if you had like a one or two level problem without a lot of deformity, right. mainly due to a herniated disc, but it's clearly myelopathy. Right. What do you think about doing a disc replacement, a motion device instead of a fusion in that setting? Got it. Um, I would say that oftentimes your average myelopathic patient tends to be on the older side in terms of rather than having an acute disc rupture, they have a lot of um, degenerated facet joints, the ligaments are thick. And in that setting, I would say that the development of that problem was probably due to um, a little bit of abnormal motion or instability at that area. For those patients, I do tend to favor an anterior operation with a fusion. But if you do get the patient where all of the, the alignment is good and the facet joints look healthy and it's truly a pure disc problem, then I think a motion preserving strategy like doing an arthroplasty is a great plan. So in terms of like a summary, I would say that the key learning points are that cervical myelopathy is probably one of the few degenerative conditions where a more urgent evaluation is warranted. Um, I would say that the key is that it's a clinical diagnosis rather than an imaging diagnosis where it does sometimes bother me that the radiologist is putting specifically myelopathy in their report, which concerns patients when they do Google searches that they get to come into the clinic with not even neck pain, they're perfect. So I would right. say it's a, both a clinical and an imaging diagnosis. And I do think that from a surgical approach perspective, there's many ways to accomplish the goals, but it's sort of like a case-by-case -case evaluation on what's the least morbid way to achieve the goals of taking the pressure off the spinal cord. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Lowe. Thank you.